Good morning. Well, it's Shabbat. It is Saturday again. At least this part of the world is on Saturday. You know, I've been, uh, I scripted this once and I said, yeah, I don't want to do a script. I just as soon do it the right way. So I have come to the conclusion that it would be better to share with you what I'm sharing in this video. Who is Jerry Lee Stencil Jr.? Who am I? It's like, dude, where'd you come from? What do you do? What's your ministry? What's your testimony? It's called, in the 12 Steps program, it's called Experience, Strength, and Hope. Now, here is my experience. I'm the oldest son of six, and uh, I was raised with a uh, uh, father who, well, he, I had a, a, a parent who was an alcoholic. And because of the physical and verbal and mental uh, and social abuse that was taking place during my lifetime as, as I was growing up, um, I started running away from home when I was like 12 and 13 years of age. Well, you see, back then they didn't have the uh, resources that we do today to help fix the root problem. So they used me, they said, well, the Jerry's got a problem, he's incorrigible. So they put me on probation. I was placed on form formal probation for incorrigibility. And there was a law against running away from problems and situations and circumstances at home that were abusive, I guess, because that's what happened. But guess what? God had mercy on my soul. And he allowed me to go through a lot of things so that I would have the type of experience that's necessary to help get me through what we're going through today. I prayed the sinner's prayer with Brother Bill Bright, who is the founder of Campus Crusade, Lord rest his soul, um, back when I was 13 years of age. That was when Jesus became my savior, but not my Lord. So it was like having fire insurance without paying the premiums. You see, I didn't know about the word of God per se. I was not disciple. I just prayed the sinner's prayer. It was uh, kind of like what they were doing back in the 60s called the love gospel. And everybody was coming to the Lord because God loved you. Well, yeah, he does love you, but you've got to be disciples in order to be a follower and not just a fan of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I didn't know that if the word of God says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's like, whoa, dude. When I saw that, I, that was like when I was what? Uh, uh, I would say like 18 or 19 years old. So five years went by before I even knew that I was supposed to have a responsibility to God. I just thought it was all his responsibility. I thought it was his responsibility to take away all the drugs and habits and, and problems and situations and make my life a bowl of cherries. It didn't happen. That did not happen. But what did happen is that I spent 75% of my youth behind bars, in cages, and I was jailed up. It's like, yuck. Um, I've had sawed off shotguns pulled on me and not go off. I have had my Achilles tendon severed and I didn't bleed to death. I went, it's like, really, it was really weird. I was on a moped and I, the, the rear fender severed my uh, Achilles tendon on my ankle 
when I shot down my feet to stabilize myself after doing a jump over the, of these railroad tracks. I jumped over some railroad tracks, ended up landing in a little pile of uh, that sediment that settles on the side of the road between the, the water and the road when the, when the water's been running, you know, that little sand settlement, sediment. I landed on it and I shot my feet down to stabilize myself, uprighted myself, but when I looked down, my foot was turning crimson red. Well, I put it up on my lap and I drove over to my friend's house. I called my mom. Mom took me to the hospital. And as the doctor was working on it, he just, he used whatever it was to numb it around where I had been cut. And he opened it up to take a look and see what was going on and explore and make sure that there wasn't anything, you know, really damaged. And he goes, you see that vein right there? And there was this, there was this vein about almost the size of my little pinky here. And I said, yeah, and he goes, well, there's a line across it, but it's not severed. If you'd have severed that, you'd be dead by now. You'd have bled to death. I said, oh. So God healed that. He fixed it. Um, I had an 824 rubber tire dozer that I was doing. Uh, I, I replaced the uh, cutting edge on it and put a, a skid plate on the bottom of the front of the blade. And the guy says, well, hey, you know, this thing is overheating. It's running about 210, 225. I'm going to put a uh, high performance fan in it. He said, do you want me to pull it over underneath the hoist so that you can pull the radiator out and put the fan on? And I'm thinking to myself, the guy's only paying me 50 bucks to do this job. The hoist and pulling the radiator and stuff, that's an hour and a half by itself. I said, no, that's all right. I've done it before out in the field where I just reach up inside between the uh, uh, radiator and the uh, lock of the engine, and I can get to all of those uh, nuts and pull them off and get the fan out. It'll slide right out. So I'm up inside there pulling this thing off, and all of a sudden I hear this click. And he went to go try to start it, and my guardian angel stopped it from starting. It went one quarter of a revolution. Had it have started up, I wouldn't be standing there before you, duh. The uh, blade separated this muscle right here. I don't know if you can see that. It separated this muscle. Got a whole bunch of little cuts and what have you here, and the last blade was penetrating my scalp by like a sixteenth of an inch. 30 seconds second of an inch, just, just enough to keep me from getting a brain aneurysm or something that would cause me a coma or whatever. Anyways, um, yeah, there's been time and time again, well, there was one time I was being, I, I went to a part, I went to go party with somebody. I was at the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing with the wrong people. And they decided that I was the reason why their crystal meth lab had got shut down, or I was one of the reasons why. I was part of the network. And they had sent a guy into the county jail. I got arrested. They had been tracking me. and. They saw, I went to county jail and I was being processed for a ticket. Now, mind you, the police had come to my place the night before and knew where I was that night before they arrested the next, me the next day. Well, okay. Apparently, one of the cops called those people and said, hey, those people, this is, Jerry, Jerry's here and uh, we're gonna arrest him tomorrow and put him in jail. So you need to send somebody. I got sent into a release tank for people who were just getting uh, cited, booked and released. And I was sitting in the release tank and there was a guy in there that had a shank, which is a, something to stab you with tucked inside of the seam of his pants. Big old long piece of metal. 
that he was laying on the floor about four feet, five feet in front of me, and he was working this thing out, and I kept on saying, boy, this is going to hurt both of us when it finally happens. Well, I started praying in the Spirit out loud, and needless to say, it didn't happen. He decided not to do it. God has intervened in every single solitary thing that's taking place in my life to allow me to continue to be here for you for today. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're told that God um, went to hell, he set captivity captive, which means that he got all the people that were down there out of there, as far as I'm concerned, and that he came and brought gifts unto us, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. We're here for the edification of the body of Christ until we all come into the unity of faith and love. I condensed that whole paragraph into that one sentence. To the unity of faith in Christ in love. You see, we're all parts of the same body. Some of us are the eye. Some of us are the hand. Some of us are the ear or the foot or the um, uncomely parts of our bodies. And those are the parts that we protect the most. But the eye can't say to the rest of the body, oh, I'm going to be the boss of you and so you'd be just one ginormous eye. How could it smell? How could it taste? And the ears said, no, 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 I'm going to be the parts, I'm going to be the head of the body, I'm going to be the boss. Well, how could he see? How could he feel? Each and every one of us are in a position in the body of Christ to help the body of Christ become more fruitful in the will of God. Because we're only here because of his purpose and his pleasure. That's why we were created in the first place. So, hey, baby. So, if, yeah, you're right. Hey, man, I got a little audience right here. Um, it's important to remember that each of us provide the body with essential things taking, that, we, that we do so that the whole body continues to grow and, and move on. Out of the mouths of two or more witnesses, let everything be established. One time I was in a, down in Chino on Central Avenue, and there, my mom had known a man who was an apostle and a prophet. Who The apostles are the ones that start churches. They have all of the gifts and ministry gifts of all of the other ministers, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher. And uh, he, there was a little mud hole down there on Central Avenue, just, just after you get into Chino, California. He was ministering down there. It was raining, and it was actually just a big lot with a big mud hole in the middle of it. I said, what are you doing here, man? He says, well, I'm praying and fasting. We're going to turn this, we're going to buy this property and we're going to turn it into a church. I said, really? He goes, yeah. Well, two weeks later, he put up a ginormous tent and was having tent revival. I don't know if some of you might remember when we had tent revivals. We don't have them very often anymore, but when they do come into town, you kind of are reminded of charlatans that, uh, that are out there to rip us off and that's the mentality that we've got going on. And anyways, he was ministering in the spirit and what have you, and he called me up and he anointed his hands with oil and he placed his hand on my head and he said, my son, you are called, chosen, and anointed in the office of evangelist, thus saith the Lord. So, oh, good. I'm an evangelist. What does an evangelist do? 
Well, I didn't look in to see when, what an evangelist does because I, it just kind of came to me naturally. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. If you believe these things, that God raised him from the dead and that he is Lord, you're saved. He came to set the captives free. You know, the, along those lines. About a year and a half later went by, and I was in another church service in San Bernardino County. Oh, by the way, that was Jack Willoughby who spoke over me. His son, Jim Willoughby, is the pastor and minister of Echoes of Faith Church, which I believe they moved their location from Central Avenue in Chino to someplace else over, I believe, maybe at Awanda, I'm not sure. But she used to go down there and check them out. They're pretty awesome. Echoes of Faith, Christian Ministries. Um, the second time was about, an, like I said, an, uh, about a year and a half later. Uh, I was in a church meeting in a little itty bitty church. It, was, it could hold maybe 150 at the most people. And um, Pastor A. Benson Smith, a prophet of God, proven prophet of God, was ministering in the spirit. And he, come up here, Jerry, I got something the Lord wants to tell you. And I come up there and he lays hands on me with oil anointing. And he goes, you were called and chosen and anointed to the office of evangelist, thus saith the Lord. Says, Whoa, I heard this before. This is deja vu. Well, that was really cool, but I did it. nothing was going on. Nothing was happening. I, but there was. Mom and I would be driving down the road, and we'd see a hitchhiker. This is back when it was safe to pick up hitchhikers. And we'd pick up this hitchhiker, and then they'd get in the back of the truck with me, and I'd minister to them, and I'd lead them to the Lord, and then we'd give them a couple of dollars and drop them off where we were going. And, and, but I wasn't discipling. I was just planting seeds or it was watering seeds. I wasn't harvesting, which is a really cool thing to do is you get to harvest, that's awesome. But if you harvest, you've got to disciple the harvest because if you don't disciple the harvest, it's gonna go, it's gonna go bad on you later on. I mean, you gotta process the harvest. If you don't process the harvest, it's gonna just go it's going to go rotten on you, and it's going to be bad for later on. About three years later, three or four years later, I'm hitchhiking in Kentucky from Louisville to Lexington. I had, it was like 7 o'clock in the morning or earlier. The sun had just came up. I had a Thompson's Chain Concordance Bible under my arm, big enough to choke a horse. Beautiful, leather-bound Bible. I wish I still had it. And I was hitchhiking, and you could get in. You now, back in the day, you could walk along the interstate. You didn't have to stand on the on the exit ramp or the on ramp to get a ride. You could walk on the freeway. So I was walking along on the freeway, thinking, well, I got. 80 miles to go, I'll get there sometime. And I'm hitchhiking, and instead of turning around like this, I just kept on walking like this, just holding my thumb up, and I heard a car go by, and it, they just kept on going, and the truck went by, and then, then this car went by. It went down about a quarter of a mile down the road and pulled over to the side of the freeway. Back light, the uh, backup lights came on and they backed up all the way up to me. He says, get in, young man. I've got something to share to you, with you. And so I pop into the vehicle and he says, uh, we're from the order of McKizzledeck. And I want you to read something. And he sent me to the scriptures that calls us to be ambassadors of the Lord, that we are all called to be ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors of reconciliation. And then he turned around to me, looked me straight in the eye, and he says, thus saith the Lord, you are called, anointed, and chosen to be a minister of reconciliation, to bring my children back onto me. Say it the Lord. 
Right about then, he, we, he turned around. There was an on-ramp. He gets off, he goes, well, we're getting off right here. And he gets off the freeway and I get out of the car. And from the time that it took, they turned left and it was dirt roads both ways. You could see for miles and miles in the Kentucky morning, bluegrass everywhere, weepy willow trees. You could see for miles, dirt road that way, dirt road that way. I walk across the street, I turn around to, to, and I thought to myself, wait, I don't have to stand here. And I look down the road where they had went they were gone. No dust, no car, nothing. The Order of McKizeldeck, Jesus, was a minister. He was from the Order of McKizeldeck. Abraham paid his tithes to a priest of McKizeldeck back in the Old Testament. The McKizeldeck Order has no beginning and no end. Angels came to Brother Jerry to tell him that he's going to be a minister of reconciliation, to bring his children back onto him. Thus saith the Lord, I have been doing every single solitary thing that I can possibly fathom to share with everybody that we are in the last days, the, last, the ones that everybody's been waiting for. The ones that the prophets of old have been waiting for by faith. The ones of the great cloud of witness that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and uh, Samson and David, they believed in this, but they didn't get the promise. But they believed in it and they died in that belief. And we are this generation. He said, Lord God says that this generation shall not pass until all these things come to pass take place this generation shall not pass until all these things take place every single solitary thing with the exception of one the gospel has not been preached around the world it's at like right at about 98 percent right now in all languages and two the abomination of desolation the man of sin has not been yet revealed now to some of us that are in ministry, the abomination of desolation has more or less been revealed to us. We don't know exactly who he is, but we know that he's on the scene. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. I honestly believe that I have a good idea who he is, but it's not my part to say, hey, you guys, look and see, check it out, because everybody's going to go, are you crazy? And I'm not going to do a crazy. I'm not going to do a crazy. I'm more concerned about your welfare. And your welfare is like this. When Jesus mentioned, and was, and it was recorded in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, and Mark 13, about his return, he was asked what, were this, what was gonna take place, and he says, and Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but I'm going to tell you right now that these are the signs that are going to take place, the beginning of sorrows. And he started listing off all these things. All of those things that he listed off are current events, 24-7, right now, except for the two, the gospel being preached around the world and the oh, wrong finger. <laughs> and, <coughs> excuse me. And the uh, abomination of desolation, the man of sin. Um, but in the meantime, we're supposed to be working towards what God would have us to do. We're supposed to be planting seed and watering seed because Jesus said his last words to the body of Christ or to his disciples. It says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which are in Father's authority, but you shall receive power. Dunamis, the root word for dynamite. You shall receive power and be witnesses about me. And he said, all these towns over there and then to the furthest most parts of the earth. Witnessing is our number one thing. That it should be our main purpose for what we do during the day, witnessing. 
witnessing. Jesus also gave us an, an, uh, an illustration of how to keep our oil going on. Because he said, you know, there were five virgins or ten virgins, and five of them kept oil, and five of them didn't keep enough oil. And when the night came, the uh, five that didn't keep enough oil said, hey, give us some of your oil. And the ones that said, that had the oil said, well, we only got enough for ourselves. You need to go get your own. Go to the store and buy some, something like that. Well, while they were gone, the bridegroom came, and they all went into the supper, and then the five who had to go look for oil or find oil came back to the door, and Jesus opens the door, it'll crack. What do you guys want? He goes, they goes, oh, we're here for the supper. He goes, I don't even know you guys. Goodbye. He closes the door. 50% of everybody that thinks that they're going to heaven aren't going, according to Jesus. How do you keep your oil? He gave you an illustration. He said, you know, got this guy that had one bag of, of, of gold and two ba three bags and five bags. He says, the one ba guy with the one bag, he hid his. The other one's doubled up. When the master came back to town and he saw that everybody had, had that, that the two had doubled up, he blessed him and said, come on, I got more responsibilities for you in her into my joy. He said to the one, you, you are unfaithful. You're a faithless follower of mine. He took the bag away from him, gave it to one of the other guys and said, out of here. Go with the uh, people who don't believe in me. Go with those people that are going to hell. Get out of here. Well, then he goes on to say, in the last part of Matthew 25, he said he had the people that, that were sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And he said to the goats on the left, he said, uh, y'all are going to get over here and bathe in this lake of fire because you didn't give me any food when I was hungry. You didn't give me any water when I was thirsty. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. You didn't come and visit me when I was in prison or sick. And you didn't invite me in when I was a stranger. And they said, well, when did we not do these things to you? And he goes, when you did it not unto the least of these, didn't do it unto me. He turned to the ones that are on the right and he goes, hey. He goes, you guys fed me when I was hungry. You guys clothed me when I was naked. You gave me water when I was thirsty. You visited me when I was in prison or I was sick. And you invited me in when I was a stranger. He says, enter on to my joy. And I said, when did we do that to you, Lord? And he said, when you did it unto the least of these, the least of these, you did it unto me. That is how we help maintain the balance of our oil in Christ by doing those things to the least of these by giving our witness and our testimony what is my testimony I've been I, I've come so close to death so many times that I've run out of fingers to count them on God has still got a plan for each and every one of you you're an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony Remember this, you cannot love your life even if it means that you have to die. That's what the Word of God says. So you need to follow the instructions. Continue to live in expectation. We've got maybe three years left. If a day is a thousand years to God, to us, and a thousand years of our time is a day to God, God it took God 6,000 years to create heaven and earth. And on the 7,000th year, he rested. That's why we have 1,000 years in the book of Revelation over there. I think it's in chapter 20. 1,000 years is named to where Satan is going to be placed in the abuso and locked in so that he can't come out and deceive the nations anymore for a thousand years. That's another day of rest, the second day. God being the same yesterday, today, and forever, 
The first week was six days worth of work, a rest on the seventh day. We are at the pinnacle point between the sixth thousandth year and the beginning of the seventh thousandth year by about three and a half years right now, three and a half to six years right now, 7,000 years. We're probably not going to see the sixth seal take place. But if you notice in the book of Revelation that the first time that you actually see the group of people that are in heaven with the Lord, you see a great multitude of people's kindreds and tongues standing before the throne, clothed in white robes and holding, white palm, and holding palm branches. And the elder turned to John and says, who are these people and where did they come from? John goes, beats me, man. You brought me here. You tell me. I'm surely you know. And he goes, yeah, these are the ones that came out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes clean and white in the blood of the Lamb. And they're here to serve the Lord forever and ever. And the final words on that in chapter 7, verse 17, I think it is, it says, he's going, the lamb is going to wipe away all their tears. All of our memories that make us sad. All of the things that cause us to cry are going to be done away with. So that we can serve our Lord with a clear conscience all the time. And not be... Uh, burdened down with the sorrows of our uh, of the past because we have regrets each and every one of us have regrets but if you don't if you if you don't follow through with something that's going to cause you to regret later don't do it do it do what you're supposed to do then you won't have a regret when it's when it comes time you won't be sorrowful for that You'll be able, that's what helps us to continue to maintain a decent walk in life. Is by doing things unto others as we'd have them do unto us. Love one another even as you love God and love yourself. And love your neighbor even as, in the same way. These are the lessons that we are supposed to be living in. We should have learned them a long time ago. We should have been living in them a long time ago, but for the most part, we're not being scolded. We're not being uh, punished, punished for what's going on. This is God's will, what's going on, what's taking place. The first writer showed up, he was given a crown, he was given a corona. He had a bowl made of toxin, T-O-X-O-N, Latin for Simple fabric. Simple fabric is uh, just that simple fabric. And he went out to conquer and to conquer. He was conquering and to conquer. Our money's made up of simple fabric. 75% cotton, 25% linen. He has completely, completely diminished our glo the global economy down to almost nothing now. People are living in their homes and they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. People are wondering when our next stimulus check is going to come. People are walking around with masks on everywhere they go. And including, oh, by the way, it doesn't do you any good to wear that mask when you're driving down the road. As a matter of fact, you might end up passing out. So you should probably take that thing off when you're driving. It's a hazard to your health and others around you. But um, yeah, that's where we're that's where we're at. The next one, the next seal that opens up is peace is going to be removed from the earth, and people are going to be killing each other. Then famine's going to take place. And if you notice, if you take all the money out of the equation, people are going to start hating each other. There's, it's going to be a big hate thing, which is taking place. It's already in the works right now. Because of the lack of money, we're not going to be able to afford to buy food, which is going to be a loaf of bread for a day's wage. 
if you make it that far through that part by continuing to do these things onto the least of these, you've done it onto the Lord. Then you've got another one. His name is Death, and he has hell following him. He's going to take out one fourth of the population of the entire planet with famine, death, war, wild animals. And then the sixth seal takes place. Now, if you make it through all the way to the sixth seal, your angel, your guardian angel that was given unto you that. See, the, the word of the Lord says that uh, are they not ministering spirits given unto the heirs of salvation? Yes, they are. We have angels that have been given unto us. Each one of us has an angel. I got an angel. I don't know where he, I don't know where he's standing. He's someplace where I, he might be in front of me. Direct, help me direct this. Don't know, but there's an angel. And in the gift that the Lord gave to me in a word of wisdom, vision, dream, uh, the building that I was in, which was like a six or seven story concrete building, started rocking back and forth 10 to 15 feet. I stood to my, head, to my feet and with my head towards heaven and my hands raised and I started praising God with every, every fiber that was within my being. I was not worried or concerned about my welfare. I did not love my life, even if it meant that I had to die. I just started praising God. Everybody else was ducking under chairs and tables and in the, in the doorways and stuff. Didn't matter, this building started crumbling down on top of us. Now, if you take your hand and you got another person and you put their hand in the middle like this and you pull like this, you can feel it, but it didn't hurt. See, there's your spirit in your soul, in your body left. My body was crushed down out from where, where I'm standing, where I was standing. My body was just completely crushed down. I looked down, there's my body down there. But I was still here. I was transformed in the twinkling of an eye. From mortal to immortal in my brand new mansion body. You know, the Lord went, is going, he's up there preparing mansions for everyone so that when he comes back we'll, we'll have a place to go to he's not fixing 17,000 square foot homes up there either that's not what's it, that's not what it's about the new mansion I was standing in it and there was a hand underneath me it was a semi-transparent hand holding me up and hand of an angel Angels that bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And I looked out across the valley and I saw other people who was as I, who standing on hands of angels. There were not a lot of us, there were far and few in between. And I heard this shout, it was the most melodious sound I had ever heard in my life. And I looked up into the sky and among the clouds, Jesus was up there. And I looked out across the valley again, and those of us who had died prior, the ones that he brought back with him, went from corruptible bodies, which is decaying, to incorruptible bodies, and they started rising up into the heaven. And then those of us who were alive and remain, even though you probably would, would clinically say that we were dead, we weren't dead. We were changed and transformed in, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We didn't die. We started rising up together with them into the, into the sky among the clouds and the vision ended. It's a word of wisdom. It's not the whole story. It's not the whole sentence. It's not the whole paragraph or the whole book. It's just a word. The word is to let us know that number one, it's gonna happen. Number two, you gotta be prepared. Number three, and not necessarily in this order, you can't be afraid of dying. Period. You got to trust in God. You got to believe and have faith that he's going to get you through the cataclysm that's going to take place. Because according to uh, Dr. Luke, chapter 21, he says, men are going to be dying from heart attacks out of fear of what's going on on the planet. Dying out of fear. 
It's going to be that. I'm going to, it's going to be that cataclysmic. Jesus didn't say it was going to be a bright and sunny day, and, and then he's going to show up, and you're just going to disappear like Obi Wan Kenobi did in, in Jedi movies, or, or little Yoda just disappeared. That's not what Jesus said. He said that he's going to show up among the clouds while these cataclysmic things are taking place in the sky. And he's going to dispatch his angels to go out and gather up his elect. And that they're going to gather them together and bring them to where he is. You see this happening. You see this taking place directly after the sixth seal. Chapter 6, book of Revelation. You got 150, no, 144,000 Jews, 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel that are sealed on their foreheads. Then the great multitude that I talked about earlier, standing before the throne. That's us. That's us. We're not in the first resurrection in chapter 20 down there. Those are the people because they had a witness and a testimony into the Lord and they did not, they refused to take the mark and they did not worship the beast. Those are the qualifications in order to get the job. If you don't meet the qualifications, you don't get to do it. They're gonna be ruling and reigning for a thousand years. Then Father, then, then Satan's gonna be loose for a short season, which is probably like 90 days. Long seasons are four, Four months out of the year, three that would be long seasons would be three seasons a year. Short season would be four seasons a year, three months each season. For about 90 days, he's going to be loosed out of the abuso. And he's going to deceive as many people as are the sands of the sea to rise up against the children of God and the Lord himself. And Father God is going to flush the whole planet all of the universe and everything with probably brighter than blue flame, the hottest flame known to everybody. He's gonna torch it all. And there's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth. And at Jerusalem, it's gonna be what? Uh, 1,200 miles by 1,200 miles. That's a big city. That's half the size of the United States. It's gonna be a city the, the size of, from California to the mid part of Texas, from Mexico almost all the way up to Utah. A city that big, that's a big city. And as far as uh, that promise that, well, God says that we're gonna rule nations with him. You look in chapter 22, the first couple of verses, you see that there is a river flowing out of the Lord and next to the river are these trees and these trees have got leaves and the leaves are used to heal the nations. There will be nations to rule in the world to come. Don't get all upset because you didn't get to rule while you were here. You have to meet, you have to pre-qualify to, to, to do those things. And that's what has been taking place. I'm going to say it like this. The false teachings of the false prophets, the false theologians, the false pastors, the false evangelists have led us down a road of illusion. And they are delusions of grandeur that have raised up within inside of us that we're going to miss all of the pain and we're going to get all of the gain. Jesus never, 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 you never got promised that, ever. I love each and every one of you. We are all parts of the same body. It's important to walk in the part that, that you are and do your part in the body so that we can go and grow. We got a little bit of time left. Get out there and share your testimony with others. Get out there and give food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, invite strangers in. Kind of hard to do these days. 
go visit people that are sick and in hospitals and people that are in prison. Testimony to the least of these, you won't have any problems when it comes time because you will have the oil. You won't see you're not going to be spending all of your time trying to figure out the day that Jesus is coming back. You're not going to have to spend all of your time cross-referencing other scriptures from the Old Testament to clarify and uh, solidify the theology that you have in the New Testament. The Word of God is plain and simple. It's not that complicated. You are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens you. All things work together for our good because we love God and we are the called according to his purpose. No weapon formed against you shall prosper and any tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall show it to be made known in the wrong for this is your heritage as a servant of the Lord and your righteousness is of him, saith the Lord. Glory to God. My name is Jerry Lee Stencil, Jr. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, and I definitely approve of this message. Have a wonderful day, y'all. Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words.